I think we can all appreciate that Photoshop Elements is a very good photo editor. It's a fantastic tool for making your pictures pop off the page. Very good for tone enhancing, color enhancing, sharpening, that kind of thing. There are a number of hidden gems within Photoshop Elements that are rather like little applications within an application, I suppose we can describe them as. For example, the slide making application we've looked at in a previous tutorial. This one we're going to look at is all about a function called Photo Merge. Originally designed, I think, in version 8 or even version 7 for stitching panorama sections together. When it first came out, it wasn't very good. It kind of stitched them together, but kind of didn't really align them very well. I think it was in version 8 that some bright spark at Adobe redid the code for it, and it just rocks because even if you've moved the camera slightly between, you know, off the horizontal between section 1 and section 2, it'll go and find them, match them, distort the frames, and get them all to stitch together beautifully. Photo Merge, which is the function that does this, has been split up into a number of other functions. Now, we've got one we're going to look at immediately. It's called Photo Merge Scene Cleaner. Guess what? You can always go to places and in order to photograph them, you think, well, this is a really nice scene, but there are loads of people walking around. As you can see from these shots, I've got a shot of a building and a lot of layabouts standing around outside. This is one of my classes, and we purposely arranged it thus. So what we do is we can use Scene Cleaner the trick or the key points to remember when you're doing this is you kind of need to put your camera on a tripod and you need to remember to shoot pictures when people move. There's no point just going bang, 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 getting four shots when nobody's moved. But as soon as, for example, somebody gets up off a bench, you take another shot. These guys move, you take another shot, and so on and so forth. So very, very important to do that to, in order to clean up the scene. So what we're going to do now is we're going to choose Enhance, Photo Merge, and wow, look at all these different ones. We're going to deal with Panorama a little bit later, but we're going to just deal with Scene Cleaner first. So it automatically aligns the background. So even if you've slightly, you know, got the calculation slightly wrong and you may have bumped the tripod, or you can actually possibly do it freehand, it will align it. There is also, under Advanced Options, the ability to get in there and align it manually. It's a very neat little tool that allows you to manually align those pictures. What we're going to do is this. We're going to start off with a picture, for example, over here on the right-hand side. I'm just going to drag the yellow picture up, and there's this chap walking across into the frame from the left-hand side of the frame. As by chance, the blue frame, the source image, has a window with him. Actually, he's not in the frame at all. He hasn't walked into the frame. So we've just got the window without the chap in front of it. So with the pencil tool, which comes in ridiculous sizes, we actually only want to have a tiny, tiny little size. And I'm talking a little bit like sort of crayon thickness like that. I'm going to outline, wow, it's in blue, that's nice. You know, pretty much the area that this chap has walked past. Okay, let go. You see, it's as rough as anything, and I let go. Wow, did you see that? So I'll do that again if you weren't watching. Keep an eye on the chap in the blue shirt on the right hand frame in the extreme left. And I'm just going to just draw a sort of approximation of where he was. And what it does is it copies the window and the bit of wall and even the asphalt that he's standing on and paste it into the final, the right-hand frame. Bingo. How cool is that? The reason that we have color coding is this. I'm going to now choose the orange frame, and you choose it by, I think, double-clicking it. There you go. And the orange frame has nobody sitting in the left or the right, the left-hand bench. Get it right, Robin. It's the left hand that's on that side. So again, I'm going to draw around where this chap is sitting here, sort of pretty much around there. Wow, it comes out in orange. Let go. He disappears from the scene. How cool is that? Okay, and that's how the scene cleaner works. It essentially allows you to draw around an object you don't want. It copies it and then pastes it to the right-hand side. Absolutely amazing. What else can we do here? Well, we can possibly put... We've got three chaps over here, so I'm going to just draw around these three guys. And you see, it can be totally inaccurate because it's over generous in what it selects. Watching on the right hand side, three guys suddenly appear out of nowhere. The reason for the color coding is quite clear that if we're using more than, like we're using two or three or five images, and we're going to put this chap back in, I'm just going to draw a little red blob over him. I don't even have to do a circle. Let go, he magically appears in the scene on the right hand side. So now you can see, in terms of color coding, exactly which images or which originals I've used to source the bits or the pixels from as they go into the final image on the right-hand side. 
Now I can show the strokes or not, but what's interesting is I can show the regions, which shows you the sections of the color-coded, so the blue image, the yellow image, the orange image, and the red image. These are the bits that I've pinched and transposed onto the right-hand side. How good is that? What we're looking at on the right-hand side, of course, is an approximation. We need to click the Done button, and it goes off and does the processing in high resolution. I'm very skeptical about anything that is automated as such. Here's the final. How good is that? You wouldn't know that that's happened. I don't think there's any mistake there. It's put everything in absolutely accurately. I love that. Fantastic. Um, I'm very skeptical about anything that has these auto, let's combine multiple complex functions into one sort of easy one button press, you know, because a lot of the time they don't work. In this case, the photo merge is a work of genius as far as I'm concerned, because it absolutely works brilliantly, as you can see there. Okay, now we'll have a look at making a panorama. Here are a bunch of panorama sections. Uh, now I've uh, sneakily pre-processed these, and I'll explain exactly why. And I'm just going to open all of them. There are six in a section. Typically, when we're shooting a panorama, it's probably a good idea to do either three or five. If you're doing landscape like I'm doing here in this old historical ruin at Baalbek in Lebanon, I shot them vertically because, of course, you get a lot more in. And also notice if you have six frames and they're all in the horizontal or landscape format, you'll end up with a panorama that may be nine inches high, but seven or eight feet wide. So just way too wide and, of course, totally impractical in terms of framing. You may also end up by having to crop the picture a little bit at the top and the bottom. So if it's only nine inches high before you crop it, it may only be seven inches high when you're finished. So you end up with an even thinner, skimpier looking panorama. So here are my panorama sections. You can see I've run through them. They're all looking pretty good. I need to worry about the brightness, the contrast, and the color probably after we've stitched the panorama. So how do we do that? Again, we head off to the Photo Merge department, and we choose Photo Merge Panorama. A little dialog box appears and says, OK, Robin, what do you want to do with it? I'm not going to do anything because it's going to do it for me. It's brilliant. I'm going to say add open file, so it just pops them in there. If you suddenly realize, uh-oh, I've left Baalbek 007 out, you can click on browse and head off and find them wherever they may be. I prefer to open the pictures first in the main edit window and then start photo merge and see what happens. Now, on the left-hand side, we have the ability to lay these out, basically how it fits it all together. I would start with auto, click OK, and see what happens. If for some reason it just doesn't seem to want to do it, then we come back, try again using perspective cylindrical. And these are a little bit more specific ways of stitching together. Essentially what it does is try and find a level horizon. So you may have to distort the ends up or bow them out in this cylindrical or spherical formats. That's pretty much everything I need to do. I'm just going to click on OK. This is where we just wander off into the kitchen. You go out onto the terrace to look at the view to see what the sun's doing today. You say hello to the cat. You pat the dog um, and uh, you go, oh, it's actually time to turn the kettle off because this is amazingly fast. You will also find out doing this process whether your computer is really as fast as you think it has. Now, before we go on, what this has done is it's found a link or commonality between all six images, it's created a wide panorama shaped document and pasted them all into there. It's then built a mask, I don't think I can turn these off, it's built a black and white mask so that they fit together. And you can see how ragged those masks are, and that really is a testament to how accurate it fits them all together. Finally, what Photoshop Elements Photo Merge Panorama is asking, would you like me to fill in around these edges? Now, a lot of people go, yeah, let's do that. And this is using content-aware cloning or fill. It's very, very smart, but it's very RAM-hungry. And I can guarantee that if you click yes, unless you're shooting with a 2-megapixel camera or 4-megapixel camera, it'll probably say, I'm sorry, it can't complete this action because there is insufficient RAM. <laughs> I have 24 gigabytes of RAM in the computer, and I still get this program saying, I'm sorry, you haven't got enough RAM. I think, how, how much RAM do I need? Come on. So what I do is I reduce the size of my initial panorama sections. And as you saw, they were reduced down by about 60%, down to about 10 megabytes each section instead of being 60 megabytes. So I bring it down considerably because then, for demonstration purposes, it can do that. 
holy moly, look what it's done here. So it's not only filled in the sky, that's easy to do, but it's also filled in and it's found some extra ruins and filled in the bottom, as you can see here. And I'm showing you this because in this example it actually works quite convincingly. If we zoom in, and of course you can do on panoramas because you're ending up with 156 megabytes. If you zoom in, you can see it's just amazing. Yes, there are some funny little bit of steps that have been thrown in there, and this kind of architecturally, or archaeologically, should I say, doesn't make any sense at all. And I'm quite sure whoever discovered this site, Heinrich Schliemann or somebody like that, would say, nah, that is it's impossible, you know, this is <laughs> whatever. But it actually looks amazing. I will generally recommend you try this if you have, in this case, maybe about 15 to 18% to fill. Any more than that, i.e. if there's more checkerboard pattern showing, it's just not going to do it or it's just going to look daft. And you may find a little bit of the grass up in the sky somewhere. So what are the alternatives if it's not going to do it? What I'm going to do first is choose Layer, Flatten Image. And so this just makes it easier to work. And so you'll see, would you want me to discard the hidden layers? And I'll go, yes, please. So bang, the transparency disappears because this is now a one layer image. And I can save it as a JPEG if I want to. And you can see it's 45.6 megabytes. So what I can do is this. I can possibly crop it by using the crop tool. Okay, and I'm thinking it's probably a little bit on a slope. So I'm going to rotate the crop marquee just a tiny bit. And I'm just going to position it like this. And I'm going to pull this down to something like that. If I want a bit more sky, I just push that up a little bit like that. I'm thinking, well, that may be OK. And I'll press OK. So I've still got a few bits around the edge. Now, in the next section, you'll be learning all about retouching. But I'm just going to show you what I do very quickly. We have some amazing retouching tools in this application that allow me to do this. I can just smudge that up there because it's just copying color. In fact, I'm going to use the clone brush tool. I think that might be a little bit better. There we go. It allows me to copy color from the right, in this case, over to the other side. Like this, very, very quickly. Okay, and I'm just very mindful that I'm just in a little bit of a hurry to do this, but you can see you can you clone this in very, very quickly and do it yourself. Or alternatively, just be a little bit more accurate with your cropping. Now, when I come down here, I'll probably going to make an absolute dog's dinner of it, but you know, you can just cheat a little bit. And that very, very simply is how I fix it up. There you go. So I'm just repeating pretty much what the program's going to do anyway. Now I can attend to making the picture lighter or darker, more or less contrasty. I'm just going to undo my process here because I didn't do it very smoothly, but you can see how easy it is to do it. I'm going to then just fix up the brightness. OK, and click OK. Done deal. And that's Photo Merge Panorama, a fantastic, uh, amazing little process. Let's have a look at the Face Replace function. Now, very often when we're out photographing, you may, as I did here, come across a bunch of people and think, oh, I like to, you know, they're cute. I'll take a picture on these are four Japanese girls out for a Sunday afternoon at a temple. And I thought, OK, oh, excuse me, can I take your picture? Yes, yes, yes. They all say so. Bang, bang, bang. And of course, when you do that, you'll find that uh, if you take one shot, you know, you'll find that one of them may be looking in the other direction. Or in this case, the lady in orange, Kimono, has her eyes closed. How very annoying. Uh, but luckily, I've taken three shots. And so most cameras have got, of course, a very fast sequence mode. You can just go pop, 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 pop do four or five shots and you have to do that really to cover yourself because somebody's going to you know they're going to make a funny expression or they're going to close their eyes so what we can do is we've got a multiple pictures of the same scene with not a great deal of movement and again i suppose technically you should have shot with a tripod of course we don't walk around with a tripod and in a temple like this you're not allowed to use a tripod so i'm going to use a function called photo merge faces woohoo open all the pictures there's only three of them and again, it's a little bit of a familiar uh, expressive tool here because we start with, let's start with the yellow one over here. This is the one with her eyes closed. And I want to show you how we can cut a head off from the green frame, which is the left hand side, and pop it onto the head in the right hand frame. Now, once again, if you find that you're having problems because these three frames are not entirely aligned, what you can do is go to the alignment tool. And as it says here, I can probably just drag, you know, maybe put number two on her earring, number three or number one just on her nose, and number whatever down. You spread them around a little bit, and then match 
those positions with these positions here and then press align photos and it actually manually aligns for them so it's a very good little feature okay so here's this girl uh, she's got her eyes closed and on the left hand side the green image she's got her eyes open so guess what I just smudge in her face and again I don't need to go all the way around the face just a little bit of the face because I just want the face transformed not the whole head and watching over the right hand side bingo it actually takes most of the head and the hair as well but now she's got a different expression how cool is that this lady here has got a great smile on the right hand side she's looking a little bit off to the left hand side in the photo because she was looking at somebody else so I'm going to do the same to her watch over on the right hand side bingo that's gone a little bit weird so I may just take a little bit more of the face like that as you can see so you may get a little bit of distortion sometimes so just care needs to be taken and let's see this girl again has got a good smile so I'm just going to paint blue on her face and transfer that to the right hand side there it is change the angle of her head a little bit nobody's going to be any the wiser fantastic so there we've got a picture she's looking a little bit quicker in that shot let's have a look at this one I'm actually going to cheat again I'm going to take this blue face and put it over there whoops okay and what we're doing here is we've got stuck on the green so I need to go back to the green I need to erase the green erase everything actually because I'm actually transferring two faces onto her head and she's looking a bit weird so we want to go to the this one here I think we'll just choose this one so we use the pencil tool we'll just put green back again like that okay that's better just a little bit more chin please thank you so much good and that's how simple it is it is an amazing tool very powerful and actually it works almost every time key things with this of course is if you're <laughs> the key thing is really to remember to do it keep your camera in continuous shoot mode when you see a bunch of people go hey fantastic can I take a picture lie to them because you actually take four or five pictures nobody's gonna mind uh, and it just covers you when weeks or months later you think hang on a minute I've got that group of pictures let's see if I can transform the heads and we click on the done button and of course it goes off and processes those in the background fantastic finally we're going to look at a feature here called uh, photo merge exposure now one of the curious things about digital photography that many may not fully comprehend is uh, a limitation it's the limitation uh, to capture a full range of tones in a very bright, bright scene. So here we are in a temple um, complex and it's a very sunny day and I've taken a picture and I've overexposed the picture a little bit and guess what the sky which is blue goes totally white. So although I can see detail inside the little shrine here um, the rest of the picture goes a little bit cactus. So one of the ways to get around that is very simply to bracket the pictures and what that means is I can take multiple exposures as you can see here one two three exposures using a tripod very very quickly so that nothing moves the only thing that's moving actually is the tree and of course there's a little paper dingle dangle thing in the middle of the picture um, and then we use software to put them together and essentially what the software does is keeps all the good stuff and throws away the bad stuff that's the idea and it's called HDR or high dynamic range processing it's a very cool feature the nice thing about Photoshop elements is one of the photo merge functions is called photo merge exposure and this is rather like an HDR function let me show you how it works so again we go to the enhance menu and we choose enhance photo merge exposure open all the frames here Now, of course when you're doing this you will have had to remember to do this i.e. record all the pictures when you're out shooting so a tripod is almost essential in this respect um, and there's the finished result I didn't even have to do anything to it it's just gone into smart blending and it's taken one two three pictures and it's basically taken the good bits out of some and added I'm going to just take, for example, you can, <laughs> this is very cool, you can take, okay, and switch them off, switch them on, just to see if it's actually going to improve the picture at all, and what I can do is I can see the movement in that little thing, let's just take the light one off and see what that does, you see it makes it go a lot darker, so it's, a, it's an amazing feature, now, what happens of course is you do get a picture that looks a little bit dull, and that's because we're compressing a whole range of hitherto unrecordable pixels or tones into one image so we're creating like a super picture um, and it's an amazing uh, it's an amazing result you can see here of course we have problems there's some people in the background there and there's some flags flapping so that causes a few problems of course when you put more than one picture together but you know it's a small price to pay um, and okay we've got simple blending and smart blending so one of the things is I can 
increase the highlights, for example, I can make the shadows go a little bit darker if I want to do that, or even lighten the shadows up. So you get a little bit of uh, latitude, I suppose, to play around with in order to fine-tune the results, because no two pictures, or sort of no two groups of three pictures, are ever going to be the same. Let's try simple blending. Simple blending doesn't allow you to fiddle with anything, and actually produces, in this case, quite a credible result. The final thing to have a look at is a thing called manual blending, and this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It just depends on how you've bracketed your pictures. So let's say, for example, we want to use, uh, we're going to use the yellow picture, and I'm going to drag it up to the right-hand side. And I'm going to use, let's have a look here, I'm going to use, yeah, I'm going to use the darkest picture, which is the green picture on the left-hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and transfer some of the sky, hey, from the dark picture to the light picture on the right-hand side. Bingo. See what it's done there? And if I show, show regions, it actually shows you what it's done. It's taken a chunk out of this picture. It's actually pretty good, isn't it? And I can probably go down in there and see if it takes it. Yep, it takes a little bit more. Okay, turn show regions off. No, it's actually darkened down a little bit too much on the little Tory gate thing there, so maybe I'll just do that. All right, so use the show regions function here just to turn that on and off, just to check see what you're up to. But that's pretty good. I'm going to take that off completely, I think. We don't need that bit. Let's go and find uh, this one. I don't want to have a look at the inside, so I'm going to just type into here using type. I'm going to use the pencil tool. I'm going to draw a little bit in there. So the trick with this thing is you don't have to be accurate. You don't have to draw around the object you want to select. You just have to put a smudge in the middle of it, and it'll take it. Let's just try those little bits there. Bingo. Well, I can even do a little bit of that. There we go. A little bit more of that, maybe. Okay, so you're piecing together, again, show regions, you can see all the little bits that I've snitched. Let's just lighten up this dark timber there, that works quite nicely. That's looking quite good. So what we're doing is we're simply customising and saying to the program, look, I don't want those bits, I want these bits. It's a little bit hit and miss, I have to say, the manual method. The automatic method, as you can see here, works a treat. And even smart blending, which I'm always a bit wary about anything with the word smart or magic in it, actually works too. When we're done, we click the I'm done button, and it actually goes and creates this output and puts it all together. So as a final tweak, we probably need to open it up in Photoshop Elements, Levels, or something like that, um, and just simply increase the contrast in order to uh, put a little bit of oomph back into the image. So eventually it outputs the finished result and you'll find uh, when you zoom in of course there are a few little errors uh, which you can possibly fix up using you know the clone stamp or the clone brush tool you know such as flapping flags these are going to cause a few problems and I can see somebody with several legs uh, walking in the background but you know these are small uh, prices to pay I think and as I say with most of these it's probably a good idea then just to remove some of the good stuff you put in just simply by making the picture maybe a little bit brighter or whatever in the background just using levels to finish it off and you end up with a picture that is superb uh, compa or superb compilation compared to the one shot you would get and where you lose either a lot of detail in the sky or a lot of detail in the deep shadows and that's photo merge exposure